Welcome to this online event. What does the UN Climate Summit mean for you? I'm very happy that you all have chosen to join us online and even some people here uh, on campus. Tonight we have an uh, exciting program for you and I will be moderating the Q&A sessions with our speakers. Um, so please, if you have any questions or things you would like to mention, leave them in the chat of the live stream um, and we, we will get back to you in the sessions with our uh, speakers. Uh, after each speech, we will have a short movie by one of our future uh, sustainability researchers, our PhD students, a short two minute movie, uh, which allows us to gather some of the questions and then we will have the question uh, sessions. But before all that, I'm very happy to introduce the Rector Magnificus of our university, Frank Bayens, welcome, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, global warming is a fact. And we've now uh, accepted that uh, one and a half degrees uh, Celsius is about the limit that we can accept. That was already in Paris and has now been reaffirmed in a recent uh, summit in uh, Glasgow. And many measures have been agreed upon by the countries. But what is it that we can do about it? How is it going to affect you and me? How is it going to affect the university? How is it going to impact what we do in Brainport? That's the topic of today. So I'm very happy that we can uh, host this uh, meeting uh, today. It's uh, also hosted by uh, the Eindhoven Institute for Renewable Energy Systems, one of the four institutes uh, that we have as a university. So I'm quite happy that we can discuss this topic uh, uh, today. Uh, it's really about the impact that it will have and also what we can do about it. So I'm excited that we have three outstanding uh, lectures uh, today. One of uh, Helene de Koning, she just returned from the summit and she's going to, uh, to share the recent uh, results of that and the insights that she has. Auke Hoekstra, I think uh, many of you know him because of uh, electrical cars, but he has a much broader perspective on everything and he will share his uh, views on it. And I'm also happy that uh, Anna Wiczorek is here today. Uh, she's the, uh, the sustainability ambassador of the university. So she has a much broader perspective on things and she will share her insights uh, as well. Um, sustainability at the university is an important topic. Um, there are a couple of items that I think where it's relevant. First of all, in our education, how do we educate engineers, future en engineers, that are aware of the challenges that we have, of the sustainability challenge that we have? Uh, in research, clearly uh, renewable energy is a hot topic at the university, but there are lots of other topics which are perhaps a bit surprising to see that they also have a an important impact on uh, climate change. To give you one example, uh, photonics uh, has recently been given a, a big grant because of the fact that we can reduce energy consumption in uh, communication and computing. And there are lots of other examples within the university uh, which can be a surprise that they actually add value uh, to the uh, uh, sustainability challenge. And lastly, uh, impact. Um, and I'll have a look at it as well. What is the impact? of sustainability on our everyday practice, uh, the kind of buildings that we build, the way we operate, the way we travel, as an example, um, but also the impact that we can have on our environment. And how can we collaborate with our environment to have a positive impact on the climate change? Now, that's the topic of today, and I'm very much looking forward to the lectures, as well as the interaction that we can have with you. Well, thank you, Frank, for your introduction and for TUE's commitment yeah. to sustainability. Um, and I hope you will enjoy the event. Um, Look forward to it. <laughs> okay, thank you. And then we move to our uh, uh, speaker, uh, our first speaker of the day, Helene de Koning. Uh, Helene, welcome. Hi. Helene is a professor of socio-technical innovation and climate change here in Eindhoven. Um, and... <laughs> a coordinating lead author for the IPCC 1.5 degree report. So, welcome, Helene. Thank you very much. Thank you, and, and great that you're here um, watching this, uh, this event. What I'll try to do is give you a quick introduction to what was decided at COP26, what are the main results, and at the end, briefly go into what that might mean for us. And let me start by saying that I was actually really happy with the results of COP26. I know there's been a little bit of negative press. I know not everybody was as delighted as I am, 
but I've seen a lot of these cops, and what we saw was really unprecedented. I think it's really going to make a difference. So I'm really happy. I already gave away um, my uh, my sort of uh, punchline, uh, and I'll explain you uh, why I was uh, I was happy. But first, a bit on how this uh, cop looks like and what kind of a cop this was. This is just uh, the the layout of the uh, the premises of the cop. So, you know, you imagine you come there, you get your badge at the A, the, the lower right part. The C is where some side events are. D is where the pavilions are, where the delegation offices are. So that's where all the country representatives are, are hanging out. Um, e and F are more delegation offices and, uh, and, and working spaces. And H is where the press is, actually. And the E is where the plenary rooms are. And those are the rooms where the negotiations really take place and what you saw on TV, where the, the, the heads of states were speeching uh, and things like that. So this is, and this is a quite a large, you know, it takes you like 10 minutes to walk from the one side to the other side. And it's, whole, yeah, I mean, there's 10,000 people or so in there, there's restaurants and everything. So you, you, you're there, right? You meet lots of people. There's uh, you know, a choice of 30 different events there uh, that you can go at at the same time. Uh, so for me, as a, as a researcher, I'm really like a kid in a candy store because there's so much information to be had there. I really enjoy being at these cops, despite the seriousness of the, uh, of the work there. So it was also a cop of lots of press, really a lot of journalism here. You see here on the uh, top uh, uh, left, you see uh, the president of the cop representing the UK, um, giving a press conference. Uh, uh, Alok Sharma was his name. It was a conference of lots of protests. I think it was the first COP where really youth was playing a much more important role. Every single delegate referred to their children or grandchildren and the importance of the next generations. It was the COP where uh, Frans Timmermans and John Kerry really became buddies. They, uh, they hung out a lot together and they worked together a lot uh, on getting more ambition in the, uh, in the agreement. It was great to have the US back on board. And finally, it was the COP with a, uh, a dramatic ending um, where at the last moment language had to be changed in order to make sure it suited everybody's needs. And here you see the final moments where even a, a, a very, um, you know, already retired uh, guy was sort of <laughs> pulled on the podium to assess whether actually the text was, uh, was allowable. So drama, lots of people, uh, protests, all the ingredients for, uh, for uh, yeah, and a very interesting event to be at. We've already had uh, negotiations on climate change for a long time, and this is also why I'm so happy with the results, because compared to earlier outcomes, this really was a very strong COP. It started in 1992 with the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, and there all countries in the world agreed that we had to uh, prevent human interference with the climate system, as it was put in Article 2 of that convention. And that convention is sort of the, the bedrock for all the other protocols and implementations. The 1997 Kyoto Protocol was a very important one. And it had a very different design than what we're now used to. It was a different time, a time of you know, optimism about international collaboration. And it was really all countries in the world agreeing that the rich countries, the developed countries, should have individual emission reductions. And that was written down in the agreement. And also it was allowed to trade emission reductions between countries, also with developing countries in a project-based mechanism. Now the US eventually decided not to ratify the Kyoto Protocol. So that meant it was uh, a little bit less uh, effective and not all countries uh, made their, their targets there. But it was still uh, a very important agreement because it really made things happen, especially in the EU, and we have an emission trading scheme which was essentially designed in that time. Now, after a lot of failed COPs in, 19, uh, in 2015, we had the Paris Agreement, and that was designed very differently from the Kyoto Protocol. It was designed in a much more bottom-up way, where countries submit what, what they call nationally determined contributions, uh, to the UNFCCC, and that is sort of their contribution to collectively limit warming to well below two degrees and make efforts to limit warming to one and a half degrees. But at, at that point, it was actually not that clear what this one and a half degrees really meant and whether it was still possible and whether it was actually really worth uh, striving for. 
So what the uh, parties did then is ask the IPCC, which is the UN uh, scientific organization on climate change, to write a report about that. And that was the report that I was a coordinating lead author for, which meant that I uh, led one of the chapters uh, together with an, uh, an Indian researcher. And I'll just give a, lo a couple of main results of that report. First of all, this, was, this came out in 2018, uh, three years ago. It concluded we were already at one degree of global warming then that at the current rate, at the then current rate, we would reach one and a half degrees somewhere between 2030 and 2050. It concluded that there are very clear benefits to limiting warming to one and a half degrees and we can still do it. It also concluded that the NDCs are not good enough for that one and a half degree limit and that if you look at the sustainable development goals and limiting warming to one and a half degrees, that they usually go hand in hand and that the trade-offs are quite manageable. So those are just the key messages of that report three years ago. And just to illustrate what is needed in terms of an emission pathway, these are the global total CO2 emissions from 2010 to uh, 2100. And the blue lines you see here are in line with one and a half degree limits. And you see basically three characteristics. We need to halve our global emissions roughly in uh, 2030. We need to be net zero CO2 emissions in 2050. And we need to have carbon dioxide removals in the second half of this century. Um, and we also, of course, need to reduce the emission of other greenhouse gases like methane uh, and N2O. Uh, but there, the difference between one and a half and two degrees uh, was not as clear, whereas for, for CO2, the difference is very clear. Uh, if we want to limit warming to two degrees, the net zero CO2 emissions is necessary for 2070, so 20 years later than for one and a half degrees. So that just as a, um, a sidestep, after this report was published, and you see the cover here, uh, there was another COP, which uh, then usually what happens is in the climate negotiations, they receive the agreed outcome of the IPCC reports, and they say, well, we welcome this report, thank you very much, the, this and these are the main conclusions. That didn't happen in Katowice at, the COP, uh, at COP24. And why was that? Because a coalition of several countries, the US, Saudi Arabia, Russia and Kuwait, basically blocked the welcoming of this report. They eventually agreed on text which said, we welcome the timely completion of the one and a half degrees report, and then they didn't say anything about substance. Now, and now we're three years later, and we have the Glasgow Climate Pact, um, which mentions the one and a half degrees as a main target, uh, mentions net zero CO2 emissions, mentions adaptation very strongly, and also mentions finance, and really received this report very clearly. We also, in the meantime, have another big scientific report, the sixth assessment report, and we can actually update the messages from the one and a half degrees report. Uh, not the final ones, they're still there, but actually the, we are now already at 1.1 degree of global warming. You know, this was in 2020. And at the current rate, uh, it looks like things are speeding up. So the best estimate now is that we would... Uh, exceed one and a half degrees around 2030 rather than 2040. So that as an update. Okay, now back to the, uh, the COP. How were we doing just before the COP started? So this is an update of the Climate Action Tracker, which is an organization that assesses the national plans, so these NDCs and national policies of all the countries around the world and sees, okay, if this is all implemented, at what temperature level do we end up? Um, and you see here that the, 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 the pre-industrial level is, uh, is zero degrees, one and a half is up to green, the green part, and if we just implement the policies in action, which is the dark uh, blue uh, version, uh, based on what is currently being implemented, we would be looking at a temperature rise on best estimate 2.7 degrees centigrade, but it could also be uh, three and a half degrees or so. Um, so that doesn't look good. That means very, very strong climate impacts and probably a lot, of, uh, a lot of misery. If we would implement the targets that countries have declared for 2030, it would look a little bit better. The temperature uh, expectations would go down by 0.3 degrees or so at 2.4. And if the pledges and the targets uh, that are committed 
in the run-up to uh, the, uh, the Glasgow COP would be implemented, it would be uh, 2.1 degree, and if we're really, really optimistic and everything that has been published, uh, promised by any country, if we would add that all up, we would actually, best guess, get below uh, 1.8 uh, uh, degrees of, uh, of warming. So we see here that these pledges, you know, if they get implemented, they actually do make a difference in terms of the temperature rise. So that's actually really good news that the ambition is, is increasing. And that doesn't mean implementation is necessarily increasing, but at least ambition is. They also looked at how credible or how um, um, yeah, acceptable or adequate the policies and the implementation uh, actions are by different countries. And here we see all the net zero targets um, that are being assessed and then the different countries that have either an acceptable or basically a poor or inadequate or incomplete uh, assessment. And we see that only a couple of countries, uh, Chile, Costa Rica, the EU and the UK, have an acceptable implementation plan for their net zero in 2050. Uh, target average is, you know, uh, Germany, Canada, South Korea, and the USA, and then we get to the poor ones or the very incomplete ones. So there's a large, you know, about three quarters of those committing to net zero have an inadequate target design according to the climate action uh, tracker. So that's, you know, the good news is that they have that ambition. The bad news is that they don't yet know how to get there. Okay, so back to the to the conference. Uh, if you go to the UNFC website. Uh, and you look at COP26 and the outcomes or the decisions, you will see this. And what does that mean, right? You see a lot of abbreviations. We really love that in the climate uh, world. So I thought I'd just briefly explain that. Um, the COP stands for the Conference of the Parties. And those are the Conference of the Parties to the UNFCCC. So that's uh, a convention from 1992. The first time that they met was in 1995, so that was COP1. And now we're at COP26. Uh, you also see the CMP. The CMP is the, the conference of the parties serving as the meeting of the parties to the Kyoto Protocol from 1997. That entered into force in 2005, so that was when the first CMP happened, so that we're now at number 16 there. And the CMA is the conference of the parties serving as the meeting of the parties to the Paris Agreement, so that only started a couple of years ago. And these are all sort of parallel negotiations tracks, and of course it's the same country, so they, they need to be consistent, but the supreme body is a COP, uh, so it is COP26, and all the others are sort of subordinates of, uh, of that. Um, you see that here the same document is actually included in all three of them, and they co call that a cover decision for all three of these uh, processes. And there was also a lot ado about uh, the emission trading articles that were in the um, in the CMA, so in the Paris Agreement, and the rule book on that has now really been agreed, and those are some of the decisions that you, uh, you see over here. I won't go into that, I'll just uh, uh, mention it, that that was also an important result of this COP. So, this is the uh, outline of the Glasgow Climate Pact, and I don't have time to go into everything, so I just uh, thought I'd elevate the elements that I thought were, were, uh, were particularly noteworthy or that I just know more about. Um, so you see an, a paragraph on science and urgency, two on adaptation, mitigation, and then one on what they call the means of implementation. There's actually some discussion on something called loss and damage, uh, which means uh, that countries that are actually experiencing loss and damage can sort of make claims about that and ask funding to compensate for the, some of that loss. Um, from the idea that that loss has been caused by the greenhouse gases of others, because often the loss and the damage is mostly happening in countries that you know, didn't have many emissions, so they're not responsible for the problem. Then there's something on implementation and collaboration just means that there's lots of, you know, we mentioned the collaboration with this and that and, uh, and yeah. So, first of all, the, uh, the signs and urgency. And these are just, this is just literal text from, from the pact. And what I thought was really uh, unique <laughs> in this uh, COP outcome um, is, first of all, uh, it recognizes the importance of science, which is very gratifying if you work at a university and especially when you're active in the IPCC. It expresses alarm and utmost concern, and that is very strong language, that human activities have caused already 1.1 degree of global warming, and that impacts are already felt in every single region. It's all over the world, it's hitting all of us. 
and it stresses, also strong language, the urgency of enhancing uh, uh, ambition and action. And it mentioned that this is a critical decade, so it also aligns this with time. Then on adaptation, it also notes again from the IPCC uh, that the, uh, uh, every little increase of rising temperatures causes worse effects. And that's really, and that, so that causes, that calls for more adaptation. And it again emphasizes the urgency of scaling up action and support for adaptation, particularly in developing countries. On mitigation, and this is really also very nice because, as I said, the one and a half degrees report was never really recognized by the COP, but now finally, three years afterwards, it is. And these are some of, this is some of the language, and it's, uh, it recognizes that the impact of climate change will be much lower uh, at one and a half degrees compared to two, which is a report straight, uh, result straight out of our report. And importantly, it resolves to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to one and a half degrees, which is actually slightly stronger language than was in the Paris Agreement. But it really shows that one and a half degrees is now the target that we are, uh, that we or the limit of temperature that we want, don't want to exceed. It also mentions, for the first time, a global emission reduction target in 2030 uh, relative to 2010 of 45%. So that is also out of the IPCC report, and it mentions the net zero around mid-century uh, level, whereas the Paris Agreement still set the second half of this century, so it was brought forward. It also shows that the ambition is increasing. Now, also in the news, a lot was this paragraph. This uh, was initially a fairly short uh, paragraph, but over time it got longer and longer. And eventually the last word that was changed was this word phase down um, of unabated coal power, uh, which initially was phase out. And this was on the initiative of uh, two countries, China and India, that rely very much on, on coal and were not ready to accept that language. And now, of course, this was a weakening compared to the earlier text, so that, in a way, is bad news. But if you compare this to earlier COP texts, it is actually fairly strong language. It says phasing out of fossil fuel subsidies. It mentions coal. Uh, it says it needs to be phased down. Uh, so that's really uh, quite a win, actually, compared to that we had nothing uh, before. So I think this is actually uh, a great result. Sure, it could have been better, but uh, it's, uh, it is important that it's there. And finally, uh, and actually the movie that you will see afterwards uh, from uh, Clara Kaifa is really focusing on this as well. There were several decisions on finance, technology transfer and capacity building for mitigation and adaptation, which is really about how countries interact on, uh, uh, and, and facilitate each other's uh, implementation. So going on to what COP26 really means for us. I think, uh, if you ask me personally, we have to brace ourselves for more ambitious targets and also more systemic change. Right now, we have a target in the European Union to have climate neutrality in 2050. Uh, I think, because we need to be CO2 neutral globally, you know, every, also the poor countries, globally by, uh, by 2050. That means that the European Union should probably move earlier. So 2040 for CO2 neutrality is probably a much fairer target. And it's still 18 years ago, you can still do something. Also important, we live in a very globalized world. Don't forget about the impact in the value chain. If we drive our electric vehicles here, the batteries, the lithium is mined elsewhere, and that is causing all kinds of effect there. We need to take those into account as well. Um, and finally, I really wish that we would have much more international awareness and, and cooperation. We live, uh, again, in a globalized world. We depend on each other, and the COVID crisis has seen that, uh, shown that even more. Uh, so I think um, uh, we need to do this together and not as the Netherlands alone. Right now we're having negotiations on the next government and um, with a professor in Utrecht, uh, Gert-Jan Kramer, I made an, an sort of a review based on science of the Dutch climate policy. And we concluded that actually in the Netherlands we should focus much more on systemic transitions rather than, or maybe in addition to, the list of measures that we now have in the Dutch climate agreement for 2030. We should look beyond 2030 and make current and 2030 aimed actions also compatible with a net zero uh, target, and we need to make the transition much more just. So we need to distribute costs and benefits uh, better, 
really heed procedural justice, so give everybody a voice on this, and also look at uh, uh, whether earlier harms are restored or at least recognized. So those just transition elements are also uh, very important. So what it means for you, you have to figure out for yourself. Each country, each city and each company, each organization, in including the uh, Eindhoven University of Technology, will have to devise its own path. So I'm very curious to hear what is your path. Thank you very much. You might have heard that international cooperation can support developing countries with their energy transitions. But how can this also help them with their local economic development? There are three ways that international cooperation can help developing countries with their energy transitions. Firstly, they can help them to get access to clean energy technologies as they, for instance, invest in wind projects there or make a donation of solar PVs. They can also share knowledge about uh, how to manufacture those technologies, how to operate and maintain them. And thirdly, they can help countries to set up policies and implement those policies so they can enable their energy transition. This can all lead to emission reduction, but it can also lead to economic benefits. For instance, if you have a wind park project, you first need to put the wind turbine together and you need people working on the project for that. And then you also need to operate the wind park and you probably need some maintenance. So all of this can create jobs. But before that, the wind turbines actually need to be manufactured. And you need people working at the factory, factories that are going to manufacture those wind turbines. Thirdly, you can have economic benefits simply from the fact that you have more affordable and more reliable electricity. And finally, you can also have economic benefits simply because all those jobs that were created those people, they actually need to buy bread. So you can also create jobs from that. And those economic benefits are important because they help to secure public support from citizens, companies, and other decision makers to long-term climate mitigation policies. This is true in all countries, but even more so for developing countries, because they still have some pressing challenges in terms of poverty reduction and inequalities, but they are at the same time the least responsible for the historical emissions leading to climate change. And this legitimacy at the national level is important because at the international level, policymakers will only agree to international agreements that they know that they are able to implement back home. And those international agreements are based on consensus, which means that if one country opposes, then you can have a domino effect and the entire agreement may be in danger. So even though we know that economic benefits are important for long-term ambitious climate mitigation policies, we don't know whether they are being created from those international technology transfer projects, and we also don't know under which conditions they are created. And this is what my research focuses on. Thank you, Clara, and thank you, Helene, for giving us a bit of an insight uh, in the COP. Um, you ended with saying that there needs to be uh, international co uh, collaboration, and that's also where some of our viewers uh, have questions uh, about. Uh, first, regarding the need for, for Europe and the rich countries to, to be a bit more ambitious and to do a bit more, also uh, because of they historically caused a lot of the uh, emissions. Uh, uh, now, Lomans from the audience uh, asked the question, is it, is it realistic to be uh, CO2 neutral in 2040? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I mean, technologically, I think we can do it. Um, I think it's mainly a question of, of political and societal will. So, uh, and of, of, yeah, devising, the policies in order to, to make that happen. And I think there are actually, um, I think we could do much more than we are doing right now. At the moment, our, our, our policies are really focusing on individual measures. Uh, they don't have a lot of synergy with other measures necessarily, don't, don't reinforce each other. And I think we could make use of that dynamic uh, much more. And we're also doing research on that in, uh, in our group. 
Um, so, and I think if you could sort of, you know, hit the, uh, the, the right spot where these dynamics can reinforce each other, um, then these transitions can go really quickly. So I think it's just a ma it's really a matter of, of aiming for, for that ambition. Um, and then, yeah, I'm hopeful that, uh, that it can happen. Okay, and, and if we try to bring that back a little bit eh, to, to this university, University of Technology, and to this very high-tech region. Um, so, so how can this be done to, to develop the needed technologies, to, to go for implementation in a way that takes into account these more societal and, and fairness aspects, for example? Yeah, I mean, I don't have all the answers to that, obviously. <laughs> Um, and I think that's also why I asked this question, eh? what every country, every city, every uh, organization needs to devise its own path. But it, it really starts with thinking about what are your activities, what are you here for, what is the impact of those activities, and then seeing where can you do things uh, differently. You will find out that you can't do everything yourself. You're in part of a system, so you will have to collaborate and sometimes uh, uh, wait or argue for things to change on a more systemic level. Um, but, I, yeah, I mean, I think it, it just starts with knowing what you're doing, seeing where you can, can reduce you, even your, your, your activities, your energy use, maybe your mobility, um, and, and then sort of going basically down the ladder and, and seeing how you can become more sustainable. Okay, and then connecting also to a second question uh, from the audience, from Aratya Bansal, um, asking uh, how are the USA, China, India um, helping to scale up their efforts uh, towards climate neutrality? And maybe you can also connect it a little bit to the value chain argument uh, you were making earlier. Yeah, so, um, well, the US basically is just emerging from a period of four years of nothing, or even breaking down of climate-related uh, institutions. Uh, so Biden has a, a very large infrastructure plan, which is really trying to change things to uh, less fossil fuel intensive uh, activities. I have to say that there's not that much in terms of uh, really reduction of demand. It's still very much a growth-oriented uh, strategy. So there's some comments on that as well uh, that you could have. Um, China is taking a completely different path again. Of course, it's a very different country, and, and India is very different again. And I think, actually, India has quite some arguments to say, you know, why would we have to completely exit coal? Uh, why are you guys telling us to do that, whereas you, you know, China's just been building uh, new coal-fired power plants, and actually in the Netherlands, we've just been building uh, new coal-fired power plants not so long ago. Um, so, yeah, they have a, India has a CO2 emission per capita of less than two tons per, per capita, which is uh, yeah, less than 20% or so what we have here in the Netherlands. So they have some arguments to say, come on guys, you know, you can say phase out coal, but we can do this later. Um, I think what is really helping is that the costs, uh, the unit cost of renewable energy is dropping rapidly. So I'm actually not that worried about the phase down thing, because I think eventually coal will price itself out of the market. It has so many disadvantages, uh, and renewable energy has so many advantages. Uh, so I think the innovation will sort of push, uh, push things in a, in a certain way. And there's some modeling that is showing that this can actually happen quite quickly. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I have a final question that really relates more to the fine. And says, so recently in the Netherlands we saw this decision of one of the largest uh, pension funds to go out of uh, uh, fossil investments. Um, what do we need to do with all that money? How do we need to reinvest to contribute to uh, realizing these goals? Well, what I, what I think is really important is that this is not just invested in, uh, in our own countries, but also invested in developing countries. The situation right now is that we have an enormous amount of savings <laughs> in, uh, in, in the rich countries. It's in the bank, we even sometimes accept negative interest rates for it. And we have an enormous investment gap in developing countries. Um, where interest, I mean, you can get like four to eight percent of reward of that but banks and commercial and institutional investors are not going there because of the risk. So we need to do something to change that risk-reward uh, relation. I think the public sector with de-risking has a very important role uh, to, to play in that. So the finance question is, is, is very important, but it's much bigger. 
than just the Netherlands or the ABP, um, uh, which is what you're talking about. Um, I think it's really an international collaboration question as well, and, uh, and really seeing how we can de-risk these very important uh, uh, investments in the South. Okay, well, thank you very much. And then we continue to our uh, next speaker, um, who is uh, Auke Hoekstra. He's a researcher, uh, an entrepreneur, but above all, he's someone who works really with unmatched passion and uh, energy <laughs> to help accelerate the transition to a climate neutral world. Auke, please Thank go ahead. Thank you very much, Floor. The theme of my talk is stop whining, start winning. I thought the COP was very unsurprising, actually. And that's surprisingly good news if you know what happened at past COPs. Maybe you know this saying, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then they win. When I took a sabbatical 15 years ago, and I changed my career from the internet to what I'm doing now, sustainable energy and mobility, um, most people thought that fossil fuels basically would last forever. They couldn't imagine a future without fossil fuels. And now I'm having a, a company and a large research project aimed at showing we can make a quick and cost-effective transition to sustainable energy and mobility, actually at a, at a lower cost. And yesterday I won a large tender to make a model that will show how we can make the whole energy system more decentralized and how we can make sure that, um, for example, corporations and, 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 and uh, uh, companies that work together in a certain area can be much more empowered. And um, yeah, nobody's talking about this fossil fuel future in the long term anymore. When I stepped into the um, electric vehicle stage about 15 years ago or so, again, I was laughed at. People said, ha, 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 he's, he's, he's sort of sympathetic, you know, it's a nice idea, but of course it will never happened, happen. And now, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I think two years ago or something, uh, uh, the biggest, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the CEO of the biggest car company, Volkswagen, basically said uh, on LinkedIn, um, follow this guy because he knows what he's talking about. And I was in a spread on Autovisi, the, the largest Dutch new, uh, paper on, on cars. Things have changed. When I started talking about electric trucks about five years ago, again this reaction, ah, you don't know this market, and that will never work, so such, such big vehicles, making them electric, ha ha ha, will never work. And now this cop, Steven Weyenberg, or Steven Verweijen, um, who I also visited to talk about this, by the way, basically got 12 other countries interested and together they pledged that they will not buy diesel, uh, not allow diesel-powered uh, trucks in their countries anymore from 2040, which is a complete mind shift from just a few years ago. It will go faster, by the way. When I started talking about energy-positive homes or thinking about them, I thought I would never be able to to live in one. It was like a, a fancy dream. And now I've basically designed my own house from scraps of wood, flex and insulation, large beautiful windows and a roof from solar panels and it can even power my car, my electric car. I mean, this is so cool. <laughs> this is not giving up things, this is cool. Um, last summer I was part of a big Twitter debate on how bad will things be. So it was called the RCP uh, 8.5 is bollocks debate, in which um, we tackled one scenario that just a few years ago was business as usual for the ICPP, I, uh, IPCC, sorry, don't mix them up, and uh, which, which said, yeah, coal is cheapest, so we will use about five times more coal, you know, India, etc., five times more coal in 2100. Now, say what you like about the watering down of the language at uh, COP26, but nobody is seriously proposing five times more coal in 2100. I think actually nobody is seriously proposing not phasing out coal somewhere between 2014, 2060, 2070. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are winning. We're just not winning fast enough. 
The second point I would like to make is that acting on climate change is not unpleasant. I'm having the time of my life, to be quite honest. I'm getting up every morning and I think I'm doing useful work. I'm getting paid to do it. Uh, I'm living in my beautiful house. The electric car is fantastic. What's not to like? It's not like the COVID, you know, where we have to change. And then the result is rather unpleasant. We cannot hug each other any, anymore, you know, uh, it, it is unpleasant. But with tackling climate change, what we choose to do is, yeah, l let me just be clear, by the way. Um, of course, nobody thinks that climate change is not a problem, right? Um, Nobody wants to cause a sixth mass extinction. Nobody wants islands to, to vanish. Nobody wants millions of people to die and tens, if not hundreds, of people to uh, to move because of immigrate because they have to migrate away from areas where they cannot live anymore. Nobody wants to play Russian roulette with the climate. Nobody wants to take, yeah to to absorb the enormous cost it would all cost. So so we have a big problem. But if you tackle this, it's not like COVID, put on a mask and be less happy or whatever. Is it really so bad that we don't have to fight for scarce oil anymore? I would say it's nice. Is it so bad that uh, uh, 5 or 10% of our North Sea could be filled with gigantic windmills that power half of our country for the next billion years or so? I mean, isn't that wonderful? I mean, look at them. I actually sailed among them a couple of times. They're wonderful. They're, 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 they're an incredible monument to what we can achieve, I think. And then the other half could come from, for example, uh, solar panels on roofs or something. Is it really so bad to drive electric vehicles? I love them. Is it really so bad that our air will get cleaner? Nobody complains, I would, get, I would guess. Is it really so painful that cars or vehicles might become taxis that pick you up at the swipe of a finger? So you don't own a car, you just own transportation? I think most young people in the cities would like it. And is it really unthinkable that we could eat cultured meat where we skip the part of torturing and slaughtering the animal? And of course, we need much less resources. Is that really bad? I don't think so. So, we have a beautiful future to look towards. It's not, it's not you know, um, giving up stuff, it's gaining stuff. So, stop whining, start acting. Um, I think the whining is from the past generation um, that thought it was with us forever, uh, this, this fossil fuels, but I already knew when I was very young, I think 12 or something, that was being exhausted much faster that was being created about 10, 100,000 times faster than it was created. So it was always going to be a temporary fix. Climate change just hurries on us along a bit to a better future. And the sun gives us about 10,000 times more energy than we need. Let's say half from wind, 0.1% of our surface, land surface with, uh, with solar panels, and we're done. Why not? And what I also want to stress is these changes go faster than most people think. Uh, actually, I think at the Technical University, there are a lot of engineers who are used to this, are used to the fact that often technology goes faster than you assume in the first place. And I honestly think that this pledge, for example, from India to at least phase down coal in the future will automatically lead, now that the sort of mental shift is made, to very quick changes. But we have to do a couple of things. We have to reform our economy. And with that, I don't mean so much that we have to do different stuff. We just have to look at our economy a little bit differently. For example, did you know that current economics basically just sees us at perfect, as perfect buying machines? That's all we do in economic models. And that our happiness is, is directly related to how much income we collectively have. That's the only thing that counts. doesn't matter if we use that income to um, disturb the planet. doesn't matter if we use that income to um, uh, make the society even more uneven so that many poor people have problems getting... No, all doesn't... Did you know, by the way, in climate models, that if a very rich person loses 10% of his income 
That's actually worse than poor people dying, because no money there, right? I mean, it's, it's a bit of a crazy system. And there's people who have much better ideas, I would say, than this. Um, people that look beyond, for example, carbon pricing, which I think is fine, by the way, but if you look at carbon pricing um, very objectively, you will see that um, most people think that actually it shouldn't be our children that clean up our mess. And if we don't think that, if we, if we think that all generations are equally um, burdened with cleaning up the planet, so we cannot say, ah, we, we make a mess now, but because of uh, discount rates, it's basically much cheaper to clean it in the future. If we don't say that, then the cost of carbon would already be so high that basically coal would be unaffordable. Did you know that? I just found that out in my vacation. It's, it's uh, very strange. Um, so, what I would say is that we need to listen to people like Kate Rayworth, who, who says economics is basically about, on one side, staying in planetary boundaries, the outer side of the, what she calls the donut, the donut economics, and making sure that everybody's happy, the inner side of the donut. And if you start looking at the economy that way, and she's a very successful economist and it works, then all of a sudden you see what you have to do, and it's very different from what we're doing now. Um, what I would like even more is that we listen to another economist, Maria, Mariana Matsukata, Matsukato, Matsukato, I always say it wrong, Matsukato, who says we should look at a mission-driven economy. Government should not be afraid to basically get out of the closet. I mean, we had a neoliberal period in which we basically did everything market-based, but the market has caused a couple of problems. I think climate change is, uh, is testament to that. And if governments become a little bit more self-assured again and start, for example, uh, promoting the kind of research that gave us the moon mission, the internet, the COVID vaccine, a very important role also for, uh, for governments there, they would task universities like this with creating solutions that could then be implemented by, by companies. And yeah, such a mission-driven economy would be a very different beast from the, ah, we cannot pay more than 0.1% of brutal, uh, gross national product to climate change. So, um, I think we should see acting on climate change not as a reparation we have to do because we're running out of fossil fuels. We should see it as an upgrade we are waking up to. We, we can now see, finally, that will give us cleaner, more affordable energy for all, forever. I mean, how, how cool is that, right? And I think if there's any place in the world where, where we could take the lead in this, it's the Netherlands and more specifically Brainport. I mean, we're ideally suited to take on challenges like this. So I think institutions like the Eindhoven University of Technology and TNO, which are close by here, are perfect to come up with an integral picture of what the future could look like, also what I research, by the way. And then we could work together with companies at implementing that vision into something that takes us out of this temporary fossil era and into the bright new future. Let's work together in the Netherlands and in the Brainport region to the place where it all comes together. Together we can make the unthinkable thinkable and then we can make saving the world big business. Thank you. We are right in the middle of the energy transition and policymakers are currently shaping the decades to come. We are looking at different pathways towards a fully renewable society. It can maybe be based on nuclear energy or maybe renewables or even a lot of hydrogen import well, policymakers have the difficult job of choosing which of these options are best. Currently, they do it based on energy system models. 
And these energy system models, they give very exact results stating how much it will cost for this nuclear pathway or maybe the hydrogen import pathway. But we know that the coming 30 years are very uncertain. A lot of unexpected events will happen. Maybe societal opinions will change on nuclear, for example, or economic developments occur. Maybe even new technologies will be invented. All we know, the future is highly uncertain. How can we deal with this uncertainty? Well, we say instead of looking at the exact results, we should look at adaptive pathways, which remain flexible. If we go one way, do we still have the ability to switch? So if we now decide to go to a nuclear pathway, can we somewhere in 2030 maybe still switch to a renewables-based pathway or a hydrogen-based pathway? Or will, are we locked in to the nuclear pathway? Will it lead to very high switching costs? Now we make interactive energy transition models in which decision makers can study these effects themselves. They can try out and compare pathways, see which dynamics affect them and which pathways leave enough flexibility to reach the climate goals no matter of what uncertain event. Now our models are interactive, so get in touch and try them out yourself. Strange not to clap for that. Yes, <laughs> thank you Nout and thank you Auke. Yeah, they are nice movies, aren't they? Um, so thanks for the talk. I have a few questions uh, also for you. Um, yeah, well, Helene was focusing very much on the negotiations between countries at the highest level. You very much stress that you can also do things as an individual and make things possible. Um, but there's of course a bit of a level betwe in between, eh? maybe the mission-oriented approach uh, you mentioned. Um, so if you think of all the things you did with your car and your home and your business, um, what type of missions and what type of policy would be needed uh, to make this, that in reach for everyone in the Netherlands and in Europe and in the world and not just yeah, the, the more privileged part of uh, society? Okay, first let me be very clear. These personal things I did, they are negligible, insignificant compared to, for example, the NEON project I created and towards the, uh, compared to the, the work we're doing at the university here. So I really think that these personal steps I mention are just to make clear that, that, that there's fun things basically you can do yourself, but not so much that this, I think what Helene said about systemic change is really where it's at. I just think that it's more fun, but also more, yeah, uh, uh, people believe you more if you also do this stuff yourself. So it makes me, I think, a better advocate if I can show that I do. But the most important, it's not really that important. So I also would say to developing countries, for example, yeah, uh, making energy positive house sh should be uh, like a, a zero. Um, uh, yeah, it should have no significance, I think, whatsoever. Just let let's close those coal-fired power plants and 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 let's not bug people who sur who are trying to survive with. Did you get an electric car? I mean, how foolish is that? So, I'm not saying this as a way to show off and say, look at me. I'm just saying, or at least not look at me, what, how, how, how good I am, how saintly I am. Look, I, I eat a ve vegan or something. No, 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 no. It's just, it's, it's fun to be able to, for me, to be able to do the stuff I talk about. That's it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, and then, then to go on uh, with electric uh, cars. So this, this morning um, uh, there was a presentation uh, also online, of course, by the president of Volvo. And he was sitting in one of his electric trucks, very happy about it, and uh, he said they were the best electric trucks uh, in the world. But what he mentioned that what was most needed to, uh, to mainstream these electric trucks was charging infrastructure. Um, is, is that something you agree with, or, or do, you think the, the, do you think the trucks themselves are ready and it's, it just hinges on the charging infrastructure, or is there still yeah, a little bit to go before we will see them everywhere? 
I think at the moment it hinges mostly on the trucks, because even the Volvo trucks are not really redesigned trucks, are basically regular trucks with, with some electric components swapped in. There's very, actually, you can no, not buy a really well de redesigned electric truck yet. So I, I understand that Volvo is pointing towards uh, charging infrastructure. I would also do the same maybe if I was uh, strategically inclined and head of Volvo. But actually, the charging infrastructure is getting along pretty, pretty nicely. I work a lot with Fastnet, and um, I think uh, we can. Uh, they already move the roofs of their charging stations up often to allow for uh, electric trucks. And I can think we can see them in a couple of years. I think the first business cases will also be in fleets where they charge overnight, and there it's, it's no problem. To be quite honest, I think the biggest. Um, a challenge we have with electric cars is uh, the, the raw materials at the moment. So we really, this, this, this uh, lining, uh, mining of lithium, etc., really needs to get going. And then it's super important that we also make sure that that happens in places, preferably not in the middle of a nature reserve or whatever. So I think that is a big challenge. And Volvo needs to produce new trucks, but they will. Okay, very clear. Thank you. Um, yeah, and then. One thing you mentioned at the beginning of your talk, which intrigued me a little bit, eh, is, is, is you, ha you had the storyline of um, when I first started to talk about uh, this, people were laughing at it. And, yeah. and, and when I first started to talk about trucks, people were laughing at it, but now it's a real possibility. Um, so that, that sort of raises the question, so, so what is the next thing that we should not ignore and, and laugh at? What is the... I think I think uh, the region of agriculture. I think um, well, I, two really big things. First of all, we should stop wasting land by saving the sky. We're so focused on CO2 at the moment, which is really good, that we sort of ignore the kind of damage we do to, for example, when we're mining or whatever, we do to land as we are reducing CO2. So that should be more in, in balance, and that you do through a life cycle analysis, etc., which you also do and try to do in the future in NEON, by the way, uh, with Helene also. <laughs> so let's not um, destroy the land by, 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 by saving the sky. And I think the next big thing is agriculture, because if you look where, where we basically... The, 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 the thing that's most scarce in the entire world, I think, is land surface, and especially fertile land surface, which we have to share with nature and with animals and cities and, and that's about it and if we could go towards more sustainable uh, agriculture which the biggest impact i think would be cultured meat then we would sort of i think be well on our way to uh, to staying both below 1.5 degrees in the future with some direct air, direct air capture probably and to uh, saving the land surface. Okay, well, thank you very much, and I'm um, looking forward to all the uh, exciting uh, research on these topics. Yeah, together with you, so yes. looking forward to it too. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, so yeah. thank you, Auke. And the final speaker of the evening is uh, Anna Wichurek, Associate Professor and TUE Sustainability Ambassador. Um, welcome, Anna. So Anna and her team won the EU Citizens Award for Energy Innovation uh, for your research on the Community Virtual Power Plant. And citizen engagement and stakeholder participation are really key to Anna's drive to bring together sustainability research and practice. So welcome, Anna. Thank you very much. So I would like to share with you a couple of uh, thoughts about um, COP, citizens and a future energy system. I think it has been already said very clearly today about the urgency of the problem, but I would like to restate it. This is a very nice quote from The Economist who was covering the COP26 quite extensively in the couple of uh, last uh, weeks. The dream of a planet of almost 8 billion people living in a material comfort will be unachievable if it is based on an economy which is powered by coal, oil and natural gas. The harms from the cumulative emissions of CO2 would eventually pile up so much and so rapidly that the fossil fuel fire development would simply stall. 
Uh, so yes, we do have a problem, but I would also like to say that there is hope and uh, we have a choice. And here I would like to rely on research of, uh, of our colleagues uh, who are historians of technology and who uh, looked at these technological developments ever since the Industrial Revolution. And they argue that we have gone through a number of transformations so far. Uh, we are currently in the fifth one, uh, but each of those uh, transformations have uh, defined certain period in our history. So, for example, we had the time of steam and railways. We have then moved to steel, electricity and heavy engineering. Then it was era of oil, automobiles and mass production. Uh, right now we are in a transformation uh, which is very strongly um, informed by ICT developments and digitalization. Now, what's very interesting about these transformations is that they all follow some sort of uniform uh, development pathway. And this pathway is called by the, uh, by the, by the authors Johann Schott and Laur Kanger, first deep transition. And this first deep transition is characterized by a very heavy reliance on fossil fuels, on mass production and centralization. What they also observe is that right now we have, uh, we observe some sort of emergence of an alternative uh, second deep transition, which is uh, driven by a totally different logic. And actually we are at this crossroad where we can choose whether we want to move on along the first deep transition or we can choose to go to the second deep transition. So the second deep transition is having totally new, different organizing principles for a range of systems. It, it's about renewables, it's about decentralization, it's about more localized and specialized production, about resource efficiency, sharing, collaboration and circular economy. Energy is a fabric of our modern life um, and it's also a very key sector, key system that is accounting for more than 70% of, of, of the CO2 emissions. The trends that you can observe in the energy system are increased deployment of renewables, rapid electrification processes and also digitalization. These more technological uh, development are also coupled with a rapid processes of decentralization and the rise of active smart prosumers. These prosumers, active consumers, prosumages uh, or citizens in general, uh, their importance has been recognized by policy, science and industry. So, for example, Inter International Energy Agency very much emphasizes that energy transitions must be people-centered and inclusive to be successful. The European Commission emphasizes collective and citizen-driven actions and moving citizens to the fore. Uh, a contribution from science, Martin Heyer, already a number of years ago, was talking about um, energetic society, and he was emphasizing that civilians are really willing to take part in the transition, but they are totally neglected by the policymakers. And I also have a quote from the industry, even though they don't uh, very uh, clearly articulate uh, citizens' importance, they talk about demand response and decentralized uh, resources. So the question is for us, how can we as a society harness this current dynamics? How can we make use of this new logic, these new driving principles, and how specifically citizens can actively shape future energy system? I would like to argue again that history helps, that understanding past is really key to understanding current shifts, because the energy system as we know it now is really has been forming for the last hundred years. And when you look at all these developments, you can observe quite um, different specific periods which were characterized by different main organizing logics and these logics have been uh, manifested through a certain technological and infrastructural configurations through groups of state or non-state actors who were in charge and who were making decisions about the rules and they were putting those rules on specific agendas. So that's one lesson. Second lesson is that actually we can observe quite clear underlying mechanisms and I would like to mention four of them. Uh, first of all, uh, context matters. So in the past we had very uh, 
for uh, transnational connectivity. So all these pathways of development, and specifically in the energy system, they were very non-uniform. Now, the situation is somewhat different. I can expect that uh, still uh, context will continue uh, to be important. Secondly, path dependency. There is certain path dependency built into the systems and uh, the way how we make the decisions is always in relation to the problems of the preceding era. Thirdly, there's always some sort of dominant design, even though there is a coexisting variety and two processes of emergence and, and coordination. Sometimes we, we feel very helpless. We think that we don't have impact. And yes, many things are happening beyond our uh, actions, beyond our will, but we do have uh, impact on how things uh, develop through negotiation. So when you look at the current energy system, um, it is an outcome of these evolutionary changes. It is an outcome of societal negotiation. And when you go back really far into the past, to 1880s when the electricity was deployed, it was a very decentralized system with very few small central stations. Um, the grid was purely limited to the urban uh, areas and also very scattered over time and through the processes of modernization, people started to demand uh, uninterrupted flows of energy. So the system began to be transformed into more centralized, large scale, uh, national with big power plants, big uh, uh, pipelines, still very much fossil fuel technology based. The whole regulatory and market uh, part has been developed in order to support the functioning of this system. But you could also see an emergence of new actors. The uh, liberalization processes in Europe has driven uh, processes of unbundling uh, of production and transportation. So DSOs, TSOs uh, 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 showed up and um, uh, yeah, I think we can also say very uh, dominant uh, role of uh, passive consumers who were only interested in getting energy in their homes. What we see right now, I think you agree with me that we still have a very centralized system, but it is going towards a decentralized um, uh, configuration. Um, uh, technologically speaking, smart grids developments, uh, flexible uh, devices, P more and more of us have uh, heat pumps, we have electric vehicles, we have electric boilers, the grids are becoming more smarter. You can also see that um, the regulatory context is developing in support of these decentralized um, uh, processes and really new actors showing up uh, on the market. Uh, many small producers, prosumers who have production capacity, so consumers who not only consume but also produce, uh, but also active uh, smart consumers who have uh, electric vehicles or other flexible assets that can be used to deal with uh, uh, congestion in the grid or, or helped uh, with balancing of the grid. So uh, this is the situation now and the question is where are we going next? I think someone said today that the future is very uncertain indeed. There is growing momentum for decentralization and these active uh, consumers, presumers. But I would like to cite here Dirk van Sintian, who is the president of RESCOP. RESCOP is a, a federation of European cooperatives. He says, we are in a transition. Citizens will pay for it whether they choose it or not. So we have a choice to be a lemon and get squeezed out, or we act and organize ourselves so that when the profit is made, that it goes to the citizens. So what are these ways that uh, citizens can actually uh, get involved uh, in the shaping of the future energy system? Uh, I'm studying transition processes and I see uh, decentralization as an alternative to the current very incumbent way of uh, uh, organizing the energy system. And when you think about it this way, the role of citizens can be discussed from two perspectives, from the perspective of value creation, value appropriation, and also uh, service orientation. So the value can be appropriated by individuals or collective. And when we talk about collective, we really mean community, common decision-making, uh, common ownership. Um, so that's one indicator. And the other one is service orientation. So either these individuals or collectives, they can uh, uh, provide services 
for the system or they can provide services for themselves. So, for example, self-consume and self-balance. So then we have um, one potential pathway is system-oriented prosumers. So this is a very individual outward logic. This is when uh, we have uh, a production capacity or we have electric vehicles and we make them available for the system to use for the purpose of, for example, dealing with uh, grid congestion. These individuals can uh, be aggregated into virtual power plants, but there is nothing collective in virtual power plant. It's still very much individual members who are individually remunerated and there is no common uh, benefit from this aggregation. Then second one is when we have self-serving prosumers, similar uh, pathway, but then um, these individuals, the household, are simply self-consuming and self-balancing, uh, for example. These uh, sort of individual pathways are very much emerging right now in Europe. They are also very much uh, in line with the uh, European law. And in the short term, I think they are not dangerous, if I may say so. But in the longer term, they might lead to quite substantial um, yeah, shifts in power. Then the collective ones, uh, if it is a, a collective community uh, that is uh, serving the system, then you can think about the wind cooperatives. Many of them are set up by communities, many are set up by the developers, but uh, with increasing participation of, of, of people. And the other one is collective inward, when there is self-consumption, uh, for example, you can think about the microgrid. So this is a very black and white picture, very dichotomous type of uh, categorization. But I would like to uh, emphasize that whenever I'm talking to people from the energy field, everyone emphasizes the importance of um, uh, still having people involved, citizens participating, but also keeping the grid functional. And actually at this university we have developed, uh, in collaboration with other partners, uh, a concept of community-based virtual power plant that is actually reconciling all these dichotomies. Because it can be inward, the community may discuss, may decide to have um, uh, self-services, or they can also decide to help the system uh, deal with the problems. Because all the, all the households are connected with the grid, then they also are very individually um, uh, motivated. But they can make use of and contribute to collective value creation. And that's a very nice picture of Luke van Sumeren. He's also going to present his research in the film that is coming uh, next. So, uh, in the LinkedIn, uh, in the Twitter, we were arguing that the Netherlands has to be the front runner in the energy transition, in the fair energy transition, and this is my, my contribution. Uh, I work mainly with Belgium and Ireland and the Netherlands, and I must say that as much as we complain a lot here, uh, it's not so bad in the Netherlands. I think we have a very good starting points, and we don't have to start from zero. So we have quite a number of energy cooperatives, even more energy communities that are on the way to become cooperatives. There has also been recently a report released by Rescop U that was showing quite a high willingness of people to support renewables. Technologically speaking, speaking all these developments, uh, they facilitate really a totally different way of organizing the energy system. Um, and actually, a lot of experiments is already happening. Um, I am very pleased to see that our DSOs and TSO tenant is getting involved in the experimentation with distributed energy resources. So we have a very good starting point. Um, also, the uh, regulatory context, um, yeah, well, we can complain about post coderos or experimentierregeling, but it has provided quite a basis for all the developments that we have right now. And a very nice example of a, um, a market development, the GOPAX, the, the platform for uh, congestion uh, trading. So we actually have a very good um, uh, starting point. I don't want to be naive and say now well, it's all solved. Uh, I fully am aware of all the uh, problems. Uh, obviously, all these energy 
cooperatives and communities, they operate on a totally different logic than the current system, so we have to engage in the discussion. And of course, there is a stack of barriers. Every innovation is a hopeful monstrosity, which means that it, it offers something, it offers a solution to the problem, but it's so totally different that it takes time for it to develop and um, yeah, to make it work for what we need it. So, I would say that in the Netherlands we have to work on creating incentive structure. Um, I don't have the time to go into all the different problems and what we can do about that, but I believe that uh, providing market uh, incentives for communities would be uh, one of the first things to do. And as you can see right now, uh, based on the research that has been done by the master student Nixian Abulati, um, we have looked into the flexibility services in the Netherlands. And actually at the individual level, we don't have any uh, incentives for engaging in the energy transition. So time of use, peak shaving is impossible because the tariff, tariff is uh, fixed. Self-balancing is possible, but because we use, net, uh, we use the net metering, then the grid is used as a unlimited storage, so there is no in financial incentive. For collective situation, it's a little bit uh, different, but still not very uh, rosy. So this is one side. We can, from a transition perspective, support the alternatives. But also, I think extremely important is that we also destabilize the incumbency. And when you look at the fossil fuel industry and how much subsidies are being allocated to fossil fuels, now it's, it's life and kicking. And if we don't change that, um, I think we are uh, not moving on ahead. So in, case of, in terms of uh, COP, um, I think there was a lot of hopes uh, that the COP would be a game changer. My reading of it is also that it's a sort of mixed, bitter, uh, sweet message. So on the one hand, there is no consensus as such. Uh, people complain that we are nowhere to the target, that the fossil fuel subsidy text and coal has been watered down, like uh, Helene was talking. Uh, we have phasing down rather than phasing out of coal. Still, this COP was for the first time about delivery and it puts pressure on the government and organizations to be serious about sustainability. All countries for the first time acknowledge that fossil fuel subsidies uh, are the reason, are the cause for the climate change. And that for the first time, actually, action was connected to the topic of uh, uh, fossil fuel. So phasing down is important. What I would like to leave you with uh, tonight is uh, my message is that there was a lot of discussion about having choices. Yes, we do have a choice, but if we are serious about moving towards a more sustainable direction, then we also have to make this choice. Thank you so much for listening. More and more renewables, heat pumps, electric vehicles and batteries are connected to our, our electricity grid to lower carbon emissions. However, we have not enough capacity for this increasing and also bidirectional flow of electricity. At the same time, also, demand and supply have to be in balance all the time. Before, when we needed more electricity, we just burned more fossil fuels. This is no longer possible with increasing share of wind and solar energy. A possible solution for this is the community-based virtual power plant, or in short, CVPP. And this is the topic of my research. A CVPP is a digital technology owned and operated by an energy community. It allows them to coordinate heat pumps, electric vehicles, solar panels and batteries and make them work together as one virtual entity. This allows them to play a larger role in the energy system. For example, they can use it to maximize self-consumption of energy generated within their community within the capacity of the electricity grid. This will increase the self-sufficiency and also lower pressure on the grid. They can also use it to sell electricity on energy markets or to provide flexibility to system operators to help them to integrate more and more renewable energy in the electricity grid. What I also found in my research is that these energy communities mobilize these digital technologies to make renewables and the other sustainable energy technologies fit better in a centralized energy system. At the same time, they also used these technologies 
to demonstrate the value of alternative solutions, to advocate for decentralization and for a level playing field for energy communities. Finally, I also explored how other energy communities can also develop their own CVPP. This is important to further develop this concept, to learn about this application in new contexts, and to gain critical mass needed for increasing its impact in the energy transition. Instead of reinventing the wheel, these energy communities thought it is smarter to connect multiple energy communities to one overarching CVPP. This way it will increase scale and allow them to pool their resources. When more and more energy communities have their own CVPP or join another CVPP, this allows for an energy transition with energy communities and citizens at its heart. However, these energy communities still face many challenges and they need all the support they can get, also from you. So, contact local energy communities, tell them about CVPP, ask if they need support and join them in developing solutions that are not only acceptable, but also desirable. So thank you, Luc, and thank you, Anna. Um, a few questions for you as well. So in your presentation, you sketched um, different logics for energy communities uh, based on different values and reasons for, for people to join these energy communities. Can, can you tell us a little bit about the, the main motivations of the people that, that take part in these energy communities? Yes, um, surprisingly, um, of course, people are interested in not losing the money, but they, they are not doing it for the money. They are doing it mainly for, uh, because they are ideologically driven, because they uh, want to support the energy transition, because they want to be frontrunners uh, in technological sense, because they want societal uh, cohesion. And of course, money matters. Uh, that's why they also want to participate uh, in the process of in the community, in the in the market. Uh, but uh, surprisingly, money is not uh, the first thing they are interested in. Okay, thank you. That that's very interesting, of course. And then in the different types of energy communities that you sketch. Yeah? So, do you foresee a future where? Yeah, one type of community will come to dominate, or do you see yeah, energy futures where they can coexist uh, in a new system? Yes, I think that's a good question. I think we don't know. From, from the past, I argued that we can uh, expect some sort of a dominant logic, but it doesn't mean that there has to be a dominant type of community. I think communities uh, that are um, fulfilling their own needs and motivations, but they are also helping to deal with the grid problems, probably have the highest chance of survival. Uh, whether we call them CVPP or anything else, it does not matter, as long as they uh, sort of uh, fulfill their own uh, mo motivation uh, and, uh, yeah, they feel that they are part of the system, which I think the whole participation and engagement actually is about in this case. And, and then we have a question from Naut about the incentives. So, so how, how do you create incentives as, as a government or as a muni municipality um, when the reasons to join are so different for different people and different communities? Yes, so that's, that's a very uh, um, uh, uh, difficult question. Uh, what I have seen is that people are driven by success. So if you have a very successful project, if people are enthusiastic about what uh, you are doing, they also want to join. Um, uh, that's number one. Number two is uh, having... Uh, 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 feeling participation, feeling engagement. So, for example, we have a lot of discussion about wind uh, cooperatives, uh, that they are not accepted. But also, when you uh, see on the television, people simply very openly demand to be engaged, so also be the owners and have uh, some benefits from, uh, from these uh, wind farms that are being put uh, in the vicinity of their houses. So, so it's about uh, uh, giving people the sense of ownership. If, if they don't have this ownership, they will 
probably uh, not be very eager to, to accept. And going by the example, uh, by going by success, um, I'm being contacted uh, uh, very often by communities just because they know that our CVPP project has been so successful. So they just want to know and hear from us, how did you do this? How can we learn from that? So, yeah, yeah, that, that would be my uh, response uh, to Naut. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Then, then one final question. Um, so you showed a, an overview of many past transitions and we know that all these transitions have had winners and losers. Yes. And this, this specific solution, is, it's quite technology intensive. Eh? You, yes. you need the ICT, um, maybe need to understand it a little bit. You need the generation technologies, the storage technologies. The, uh, does this scale to also include those members of the community that um, maybe cannot afford all these technologies or don't have the space for it or are simply yeah, not that interested or too busy? Yeah. Or, so how does it scale up in an inclusive way, basically? Yeah, so this is one of the issues that the communities should uh, consider, um, um, how they want to go about engagement and also inclusiveness of those who are in the vicinity and cannot afford to participate. Uh, it's up to the communities uh, to think about how they want to organize themselves. Um, so um, I, I leave it up to people and, and I believe that they can make uh, good choices about that. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And also a big thank you to our other speakers and uh, to the PhD students and all the support staff that made this uh, event possible today. Um, and finally, of course, a big thank you also to you, our audience. We are very happy that you uh, yeah, chose to join us online. And we do, of course, very much hope to uh, be able to uh, meet you here on campus uh, sometime uh, in the near future. Um, but for now, I hope you enjoyed the event and uh, thank you very much. Bye-bye.